Amen. <laughs> Amen. As our children are dismissed. Amen. God is truly good. Uh, I just was informed today that we've been donated a sound system for across the way. Isn't God moving so for our young people? Yeah. So God is truly blessing. It's also good to see uh, Reverend Reeves back. He was all the way dropping his daughter off in London. Yeah, uh, he, he got back uh, last week and he said, I'm, I just need to recover. I need a little time. I said, take your time. I, 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 you come back. <laughs> take your time. Come on back. So it's good to see him here. And it's good to see all of you here this morning. If you would stand with me, we're going to continue in our series of sermons. We're going to be looking at lessons from the Old Testament. And so this morning, I want us to look at 2 Kings chapter 5. And I'm going to read verses 8 through 14. So 2 Kings chapter 5. Verses 8 through 14. And it reads this way this morning. And so it was when Elijah, the man of God, heard the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. And then Naaman went with his horses in chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I say to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Aren't, aren't not the Abbot and the far par the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Can I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage and his servant came near and spoke to him and said, my father if the prophets had told you to do something great would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the sayings of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like a little child, and he was clean. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God in heaven, again, we thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you for your very presence. We thank you for your move in this place. Lord, we ask you to open up our hearts and our minds so that we can receive what you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. This morning I wanted to look at this text and I want us to look at it from the vantage point, the attitude of Naaman. The attitude of Naaman. Look to someone next to you and say, check your attitude. Amen. <laughs> Two people went to the same church, and one said, there is no evangelism here. I'm going to a different church. While the other said, there is no evangelism here. And he says, I'm just the one to get it started. Your attitude makes all the difference in the world. See, the, the, the account of Naaman, the Syrian, gives us some insight into the importance of a proper attitude. Now, now to put some context into the scripture that I read this morning, let us look at Naaman. Now, now Naaman was the chief commander in the most powerful country in the Middle East at the time. He, he was the head of the army in Syria. He was under uh, the most powerful king of the time in the Mediterranean and he followed him. But Naaman had a problem. He was afflicted with leprosy. Now, now leprosy is a very horrible disease. Even uh, uh, back then, it was, it, it was seen as a death sentence. You see, leprosy was a slow 
progressive stubborn disease and it was characterized by lumps under the skin and you would scar and the person where the leprosy was would lighten up and, and, and as the disease progressed it caused the loss of fingers and toes. They would literally just drop off. Now in Naaman's house there, there was an Israelite servant who served Naaman's wife. Now, if, if you understand what was going on in previous in the text, it, it talked about how the Syrians, the most powerful country at the time, was uh, very strong and they would send raiding parties into Israel. And at these raiding parties, they would take the women back to Syria. And it was one of these um, um, Israelite women who was um, taken from the Syrians and there was working for Naaman, who was the chief officer in the Syrian army. And she said, there's a prophet in Samaria that could heal your husband. And, and, and the woman gets excited and, and Naaman gets excited. And if you understand the context, the Samarian woman was an Israelite. And the reason why it's called Samaria in some translations is because there was a civil war with the Israels, Israelites. And the, the war happened is you have the northern, which was the Syrians, I mean the, the um, Samarians, and you had the southerners who were sort of the Judeans. And, and, and these two uh, particular people didn't like each other. And, and so when they were invading into these places, they would take these women and the women would go out and, and they would be their servants. And so this Samarian Israelite woman was working for Naaman, the most powerful commander-in-chief of the most powerful army in the world at the time, told Naaman's wife, hey, there is someone who can heal you in Samaria. There's someone who can heal you in Israel. And when Naaman got a hold of this, he went to his king, the most powerful king in the region at the time, and he says, you have to send me over there so I can be healed of leprosy. And the king says, I'll send you with a letter. And not only will I send you with a letter, I will send you with gold and all kinds of things that you can give tribute to the king of Israel. And when the king of Israel received the letter from uh, this uh, Naaman as uh, kings, um, he, he begins to get nervous because the most powerful country in the region at the time sends a letter to Israel. And, and the Israelite king, he opens the letter and he says, this king is trying to start something. He's asking me to heal somebody that there's a death sentence. How am I going to heal this man of leprosy? And so he tears off his clothes. He didn't know what to do. And, and, and then Elisha hears about the circumstances that the king finds himself in. And, and Elisha basically says, send him to me. I will take care of him. And then they will know that there is a prophet in Israel. And, and that's where we pick up this text where we have Naaman standing at the door of Elisha. Now, if we look closer at the text, we will notice the different attitudes of, of Naaman, the Syrian, in this text. And it will supply us some lessons that we could live by. Now, the first type of attitude we see in this text from Naaman is the I thought attitude. If you look at verse 11 again, it says, But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I say to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. You see, Naaman expected something different than what the prophet offered him. You see, Naaman thought he was going to get fire from heaven. He, he thought because of who he was, remember, he was the commander-in-chief of the most powerful country in the region at that time and he brought all this silver and gold with him and he brought all this stuff and so he was an important guy and he thought that when he was going to Elijah's house Elijah was gonna call the fire from heaven down to heal him from leprosy but Naaman didn't even bother to go to the door he sent his servant and says you go dip in the Jordan seven times uh, and so the thing we see this morning is Naaman expected something different than what had happened. 
You, you see, Naaman was angry. And when he got angry, he, he began to ponder about why didn't even uh, Elijah come to the door? You, you see, he should have just been satisfied for just having an opportunity to be cleansed from leprosy. But no, he expected something. And, and so this is the, the exact attitude many Christians have today when they are confronted with God's word and will for their life. You, you you see, many become angry because they think they have that attitude. They, they, they I think, I, I, I thought God would have sent me that man or that woman that I should have been married by now. You see, oftentimes people think that God should have given them that job or that house or that car or that promotion that they've been wanting. He said that God should have been done that for me by now. You, you, you are looking for stuff. But God is looking to change you. You see, God knows that if he changes you, you can handle the stuff. God knows that if he gives you the stuff before he changes you, you couldn't handle it. So God has to sometimes say, wait a while. I, I, I got to fix you before I give you the stuff that you're looking for. So as you're looking for something, you might need to think that you may not be ready for what you're going to get. You, you see, Naaman was upset because there was no fire from heaven because he thought that God was going to heal him in a certain way. But God is more interested in the person than the process. You see, I, 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 many people think that I, I, I think my relatives or my husband or my wife or my mother or my father should be healed or cured or restored by now. But God might be saying to you instead of healing or restoration or cure that I'm going to give you the strength to live with it or through it. You see, God is not in heaven looking down concerned about making you more or less comfortable he is concerned about getting you ready for heaven and, and using you to get your mission here on earth completed you see God is worried about you he's not worried about the peripheral stuff of life God wants your soul to be changed God wants you to be ready for heaven God wants you to live out your mission here on earth so don't put God in a box. You, you, you see, we, we, we need to be more concerned with what God thinks than what we think. You see, our thoughts are no consequence in compared to the thoughts of God. You, you see, God knows what he needs to do and where he needs to put us to get his will done in this earth. You, you see, the, the next attitude that we see from Naaman is also found in chapter 5. Verse 11, and this is the attitude that I expected more than was given. I expected more than what was given. You, you see, Naaman was expecting a, a special ceremony. He, he, he was expecting something different than what he got from Elijah, and he became angry. You, you see, the most powerful uh, chief in, in, in the Middle East at the time, he, he says, I, I, I am somebody. I, I expect at least a ceremony. I, I expect to someone to come out to me and tell me that you are special and we are going to heal you. And when he didn't receive his special ceremony he gets angry he gets upset he, he, he says what's going on you, you see many people in the church today they, they get mad and leave because they are not getting what they expect from church they they're not getting what they expect from God they're not getting what they expect from other people because of who they are they, they're expecting more it, 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 it could be not getting what you want you see many Christians Think like Naaman because of their position, because of what they have, because of who they are. They, they feel that they need to be treated differently. They, they, they should be sitting in the front row or they should be called such and such. These type of Christians are the ones who say, I, I, I need to go to that church where the who who's go. You, you, I need to go to the church where the people who have money. I, I need to go to the church where the people have some fame and some power and some influence. Uh, you, you, you know these type of churches where 
you have to dress up in a certain type of suit. You, you know these type of churches. You have to drive a certain type of luxury car. You know these types of churches who you have to live in the best community to be a, a real member. You, you see, in these types of churches, the music has to be on par all the time. The preacher has to sound a certain way. These types of churches oftentimes become no more than a place where people go to display their power, their influence, their, their money, a place where people go to try to get these things. I, I, I'm reminded this morning of, of a series that I, I like to watch, The Green Leafs, and, and in this series, they, they run it like a business, and they got all this stuff, and they're so worried about influence and power and all this stuff in the community, and, and, and they've gotten to a certain point now that everybody's sleeping with everybody, and there seems to be no consequences in the church. You see, that's the kind of church that God is not looking for. You, you, you see, r r r r the, the type of church, oftentimes people think that God has to give them something special because of what they have. But you, you know what the kind of church God is looking for? The kind of church that God is looking for is one that is not overly concerned with its power and influence in the community, but it's concerned with saving the lost, comforting the uncomfortable, encouraging the discouraged, feeding the hungry. That's the kind of church God is looking for, the kind of church who goes out and reach the needs of the people. It's not about who you are because of what you have. We, 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 don't, we shouldn't be expecting God to do something special for us because God already has given us his only son, Jesus the very Christ. The Bible says that he sent his son to die on the cross at Calvary. Uh, hasn't God done enough? But there are some people who say, I expect more from God. We, we also see in this text that Naaman thought that something greater would have happened in the process of his healing. He, he, you see, Elisha said, just go out and dip your foot in the Jordan. And, and, and so Naaman thought, hey, uh, th there has to be more to it than this. But, but, but the greater event could have not occurred unless he obeyed what Elisha told him to do. You, you, you see, the greatest uh, miracle was the healing, and, and he was looking for the process. But Jesus is telling us that we, we, we need to be concerned with salvation. You, you see, the text lets us know that which was greater was already there, but he had overlooked it because he was looking for something else. You, you, you see, many people today are expecting something greater out of religion. And religion is just simply uh, man's interaction with the divine. You see, many people are looking for money or houses or cars or land from God. They're looking for a blessing. They, they go to these churches and say, God has to bless me. God has to heal me. God has to give me stuff. But we, and we're looking for more from God, while, while others are looking for some esoteric experience, speaking in tongues or, 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 or being slain in the spirit, or, or, or some people even want an angel from heaven to come down and to speak to them personally. But the good news this morning is that God has given us uh, the miracle of Jesus Christ. But the, the greatest of all is the forgiveness of our sin. We, we, what more are we looking for? The greatest thing at all is that we have a home in heaven. What more could we be expecting from God? You see, the greatest thing is that God puts us in a community where we have fellowship. What more are we looking for? Are we looking to be entertained Sunday after Sunday? Are we looking to be connected to God? You see, that is where the real miracles come from. You see, just like Naaman, he was expecting stuff, but God was expecting the change in his heart. You see, God is is getting us ready for heaven and to live out his plan for us. So, 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 so we, we have to get rid of that attitude of putting God in a box. Don't put God in a box because you don't know how he's going to give you your blessings. You, you don't know how God is going to bless you this morning. You, you see, oftentimes I, I look at the church and I say, God, where is the blessing? Where, where, what's going to happen here? What's going to... And God says, hold on, wait a minute. Don't put me in a box. Don't tell me how I should bless you. You just wait and God will bless all of us. 
as he sees fit. Don't put God in a box. Now, 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 the next type of attitude we see in Naaman is found in verse 12, which is the attitude, I would rather do something else. I would rather do something else. You, you, you see, if, if you look at verse 12 again, it says, Are not the Abba and the far part, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in anger or rage. And, and, and so this tells us he, he was trying to even go back to the past. He, you see, Damascus, that's where Syria was, the rivers of Syria. He says, I, I could have did this when I was at home. Why, why did I have to come all the way to Israel to get a blessing? You see, sometimes when we're waiting on God, we will go back and try to do it our way. We, we would try to go back to where God has brought us from and we will expect a miracle. You see, God needs to move us away from our sins and then put us in a new place and don't look back. I, 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 I spent some time with a friend yesterday and, and he, had some, he, he had some alcohol problems and he kicked the habit. And then yesterday I just seen some, just broke my heart. It's just like you're going back in the same direction in which God has delivered delivered you from. You, you need to keep pushing forward. Don't, don't look back. You, you see, Naaman was looking back. He, he, he was saying, I, I could have got my miracle when I was back there. But God says, no, I'm going to need to push you forward. You, you see, Naaman complained about having to dip in the old dirty Jordan. You see, the Jordan was muddy because it was, it's a tributary. It, it wasn't like those other two streams where it comes straight from the mountain and the water's fresh and clear, but the, the Jordan was kind of muddy and kind of dirty and, and this pristine guy who had leprosy, but he, he was the commander in chief of the Syrian army. He says, why am I going to put my foot in some dirty water? You see, sometimes God is calling us to get dirty. Sometimes God is calling us to get into the mud. Sometimes God is calling us. If you want to be blessed this morning, you're going to have to help some people that you wouldn't ordinary help. You're going to have to talk to some people that you wouldn't ordinary talk to. You would have to get into some people's lives that you don't want to get into. You see, God is calling us to dip our feet in the muddy waters of life. If, if, if you're too proud for it, if, if, if you're if you too uppity, if, if you got too much, if, 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 if you say, I can't do it, then will God bless you in the way that he could bless you if you just put your foot in the muddy water? And, and, and that's why I, I say it's so important about this evangelism class. Yes, it's going to be hot. Yes, we're going to sweat. Yes, we're going to get doors slammed in our face, but we're going to have to get our feet feet muddy in the muddy water. We're going to have to go out into the world. We can't just be here all the time and expect people to come. we got to get our feet wet and dirty. We, there's going to be some time we're going to get cussed out, slammed doors, talked about, talk about are you this or are you that, but God is calling us to a higher standard. We're going to have to dip our feet in the Jordan. And, and, and we're just going to have to do it. On, you, you see, today many people complain about how God moves in their lives. You, you, you heard it before. That God is moving too slow in that situation. God is moving too fast in that situation. God is moving me in the wrong direction. Or even God is not moving at all. You see, God is moving you as fast, as slow in the direction he wants you to go. He knows what you can handle. Sit back and listen to God. If God tells you to go dip your feet in the muddy Jordan, you better go dip your feet in the muddy Jordan. And whatever that muddy Jordan might be, you need to dip your feet. Now, now, now many people today complain about God's cure for sin, for example. They, 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 don't, they, they say it's just too simple. All you got to do is have faith in Jesus Christ. There got to be more than that. You see, there's religions all over the world that says, no, you got to have some works. You got to do something. You got to do this. You got to do that. But Jesus tells us all we have to do is have faith in Jesus Christ and we can be born again. That, that, that might sound too simple for some, but the Bible says that's all we have to do. But, but then once you become a Christian, there, there are some Christians who are so faith-minded, they don't want to do nothing. And so God has to remind us with James when he said faith without works is dead. You see, some Christians will just want to sit back and say, I'm saved and I'm ready to go to heaven. I ain't going to do nothing. But the Bible says that we need to work out our salvation. And, and, and that's what we must do. You see, sometimes uh, people...
people try to put God in a box and try to do it their own way. You see, if it was left to Naaman, Naaman would not have been healed because he would have went away upset. He would have went away mad. He, he would have went away saying, oh, th th this man is not knowing what he is doing. You, you see, and this leads us to the next attitude that, that we look at this morning. And it's not even the attitude of Naaman, but it's the attitude of his servant friend. And, and this attitude would be called a caring attitude. A caring attitude. If, if you look at verse 13, it says, And his servant came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if you're the prophet, excuse me, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? You see, Naaman's sermon pointed out, or servant pointed out to him, how ridiculous his attitude was. You, you see, name his servant, ask him, if the prophet would ask you to do something very hard, wouldn't you have done it? And, and, and he brought to light the foolish attitude of Naaman. You, you see, the servant says, why reject something so easy? And, and, and Naaman was lucky to have such a good friend. You, you, you see, the world needs more friends who are willing to show them the error of their way. You, you, you see, this lesson tells us this morning that who's around you matters. You see, they oftentimes say birds of a feather flock together. And, and, and you need to know that who's around you is important because if he had the wrong servant around him, if he had a yes man around him, if somebody who just says, yeah, you know what, Naaman, you should be mad. They should have gave you a ceremony. There should have been fire from heaven. Yeah, Naaman, they should have sent you back to Damascus to dip your foot in their river. But this servant had enough sense to say, hey, all that other stuff didn't work. You better try what Elijah told you to try. And you better have friends around you who, who see you doing wrong, who, who see you going in the wrong direction and say, hey, you better try Jesus. You better get out of your mess. You better stop doing what you're doing because you're going in the wrong direction. You, you, you see, sometimes uh, you need to be corrected. I, I know some people, you ain't gonna give me no amens on that because you, sometimes you, you wanna do wrong. You, you don't want nobody around you to do to tell you when you're doing wrong. You, you just want to do wrong all by yourself. You, you want to feel comfortable with that sin. But there has to be somebody who's bold enough, who's, who's daring enough to tell you what you're doing wrong. And, and, and that's why it's important for our, uh, the, the elders behind me because they, 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 they oftentimes tell me, Coop, you need to go in a different direction. That ain't right. And if, 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 if I had the wrong people around me, they'd be giving me the wrong information. And, and so it's important to have the right people around you. Right. And, and, and the call this morning is, not only do you have the right people around you, but are you the right person around other people? Do you have enough guts to tell somebody that they're doing wrong? You, you, you see, some people who, who want to just be friends so much that they'll just tell you anything. That, that, that they don't care enough to be feeling uncomfortable enough to tell you that you're not doing what God has for you to do. And so the call this morning is not only be around the right people, but have the, be the right person for God. And, and, and then we, we see the next attitude of Naaman again. He had the attitude of obedience. The attitude of obedience. If you look at verse 14, it says, And so he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Now, now Naaman fully recognized how foolish he was because of his friend, and he obeyed Elijah's command. And, and, and we need to put away our pride. We, we need to put away our big head. We, we need to put away because of who we are and begin to obey God for what he says for us to do. You see, sometimes uh, we, we get so stubborn, we, we get so caught into sin that we don't want to get out of sin. But you see, this attitude of obedience is what we need today. You, you see, when we start doing the things that God wants us to do, we will begin to see blessings in our lives. If you think God is blessing you now, 
Just imagine if you're doing what God tells you to do in most of your situations and your circumstances and your trust in him, how God will open up the doors of heaven. And, and, and they'll be so full that we can't contain all that what God will give us. But, 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 but see, we, we, we are so tied to this world. We, we, if God gives a little blessing, we'll take that blessing and we get stingy with it and we don't want to share it and, and we don't want to use what God has given us to help other people. And then God said, why am I going to bless you more if you're not going to bless other people with the blessings I give you? You see, we need to have an attitude of obedience. We, 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 we need to sacrifice ourselves to God. You, you, you see, when, when, when we have a call that says, we need your help to come out. And, and to evangelize into the community. We, we, can, we can shout, we can scream, we can cry, we can beg, but it's going to take your volition, it's going to take your will to come out here and do what God has called you to do. We, we, we call for every Wednesday, come on out. You, you, you can't grow in Christ in isolation. You need a Bible study. And, 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 and we keep saying, come out, come out, and, and, and few people come out, and, and, and so, if the Bible study is not what you think is productive for you, then you need to give us some suggestions. We can, we can tailor our Bible study around you. See, it's not about us teachers. It's about you growing you. It, it's not about us. It's about you. Because we want you to be the best person God wants you to be. And the only way you can do that is if you study the Word of God, if you get into the Word of God. It's not just, oh, I'm going to pick John today, boom. But if you don't know the context, if you don't know where it come from, you don't know, you, you misinterpret it, you don't know how no real meaning, and, and then you're like, well, how come God is not really showing me? Because you're not studying systematically the Word of God. You see, you need the Word of God in your life. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm glad to see you on Sundays. I get happy when I see all your bright faces, but I, I need to see you on Wednesday. I, I, I need to see you on Saturday. I, I need to see you at Bible study. I, I need to see you bring your family members here. I need to see you bring your children here because they are the next Community Baptist Church. When we all dead and gone, it's going to be them. You see, if you really think about it, we owe what we got to the people who left it to us. Yeah. I look around and I see these pianos and I see these organs. And I see all this stuff. And I said, we don't have to buy that again. And, and you may say, that's not a big deal. Well, my brother is starting a church and, and he knows how hard it is to buy a piano and an organ and a building. You see, God has left us with some stuff. And we need to leave our children with some stuff too. And, and, and we can't do that if, if we're just too lazy. And I'm not calling y'all lazy. Come on. But if, if, we, if, we, if we don't want to move, if we don't want to move, we, we, we got to move. We, we got to move. I'll leave it there. We got to move. You, you, you see that, that obedience. With obedience comes blessing. You, you see like Naaman that put his foot in the Jordan. He received a blessing. You, you see, when you do what God has you to do, th there is blessings in the mix. You, you, you see, the old slaves used to sing a song about the Jordan. They, they, they said, roll on, Jordan, roll on. And, and they were referring to Africa, their home. But when we talk about Jordan today, uh, we're talking about our home that's not on earth. Uh, we are looking for a home in heaven. Uh, isn't that good news this morning? Uh, you need to dip your foot in the Jordan. Uh, how are you going to get across the Jordan? Uh, you're going to have to have Jesus, the very Christ, uh, who died on Calvary. Uh, Calvary, he hung uh, as he did. Uh, but they tell me he died on on the cross uh, but on the third day he rose again uh, isn't that good news yeah. this morning uh, that we serve a risen savior with all power in his hands uh, and that is a good news this morning uh, dip your feet in the Jordan uh, if you don't know how uh, let me tell you how uh, there is a man named Jesus uh, he will guide you through the Jordan uh, until you make it to your home uh, isn't that good news 
news of this morning. Uh, if you fall, uh, Jesus is there to catch you. Isn't that good news yeah. of this morning? Uh, I dare you to go across the Jordan because your home is in heaven. Uh, isn't that good news yeah. this morning? Uh, God is there with you. God is good. God is good. Uh, I dare you to say God is good this morning. Uh, if God has been good in your life, uh, I dare you to stand up and say hallelujah. Hallelujah, God is good. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? God is good. God is good this morning. God is good. God is good. God is good. God is good this morning. God is good. Amen. We've heard the word this morning. Amen. 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 Give us a little bit, Scott. Just a little, little touch. Eh? Oh, wait. Sing it with us, y'all. Have thine own way, Lord. Have God plays softly. Let, let, let me remind you something. We stood here last week praying. Who would have thought in Las Vegas at a country music concert that we would have the, that <laughs> destruction like that that we've never had in our history before, right? You, you might expect that at a rock concert or maybe even a rap concert, right? At a country music? Man. Anyway, we're here today. We didn't come here this morning just to sing a few songs and hear the preacher talk. This is not business as usual. Somebody needs to accept Jesus Christ today as their Lord and Savior because today is the day of salvation. Those people, they, a lot of Californians left here last week going to Vegas to have a good time. They didn't make it back to California. They didn't make it back. But you have an opportunity today to accept Jesus Christ because tomorrow the Bible tells us it's not promised to any one of us. We have that opportunity right now to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you just make one step and he'll, he'll, he'll make the other ones. I've heard some songs that if you make one step, he'll make two. But you just have to make that step today and He's going to do the work. It's nothing that if we could do it by ourselves, we wouldn't need him. He's going to do the work if we would just have a willing heart to come. So it's not just a matter of getting your mind. Get a mindset. And God will change your will set. Now is the time. Now, just on the other, on the other side of that, there's some of us here today knowing you know we, we, we've been saved and all of that but we know God has something for us to do and we keep putting it off just like those people in uh, Las Vegas we're not promised tomorrow we, something could happen to you today and you didn't get a chance to do what God's called you to do so it's time for you to rededicate yourselves today because after this life we're gonna live eternity we're gonna be living in eternity we might live here for what maybe what 70 or 80 years that but eternity is eternity amen so now is the time to rededicate yourself you know what God's called you to do and if he's called you to do that once again he's going to do the work we just have to be willing to let him do it amen